Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Ε, θα κάνω τρομιλέ στα αγγλικά, αν δεν σα πειράζει, γιατί μου είναι πιο εύκολο. Αλλά μετά μπορούμε να απαντήσουμε στα ελληνικά τι ερωτήσει. Uh, the subject is about uh, novel strategies for de-escalation in the context of retropharyngeal lymph node metastasis using TORS, which is transoral robotic surgery. So just to start, I don't have any conflicts of interest. So as we all know, surgery for the management of head and neck cancer has been, the, its history has been that of a shifting pendulum going between surgical treatments and non-surgical treatments such as chemotherapy and radiotherapy primarily and more recent immunotherapy. Um, in terms of the basics, because, uh, in terms of retropharyngeal lymph nodes, these are important, it's an important lymph node group because it represents the first echelon lymph nodes for a variety of head and neck sites and subsites, which includes the nasopharynx and posterior pharyngeal wall. And obviously the posterior pharyngeal wall extends from the nasopharynx down to the hypopharynx. And uh, they are among the first echelon for the oropharynx, we've just been talking about. Uh, cervical esophageal SEC also commonly is associated with retropharyngeal metastasis, and importantly, DTC, differentiated thyroid cancer, which is a different disease entity than SEC, but is in the head and neck, also can present, particularly in the recurrent setting, with retropharyngeal lymph nodes. In terms of the anatomy, uh, as the name suggests, the retropharyngeal lymph nodes are placed posterior to the pharynx and anterior to the prevertebral fascia. Laterally are the carotid sheaths on either side. Superiorly, they start from the scalp, below the scalp base, and inferiorly, they go down to the C3 level anatomically. It is very important to understand that there are two different subgroups in that uh, lymph node region, the medial and the lateral groups. It is the lateral ones that are of clinical relevance, the, also known as the nodes of Rouvier, which are associated with the carotid sheath at the level of the skull base. These are almost always the ones that are involved in metastatic disease. This area is associated with uh, a lot of very, very important neurovascular structures, including the internal carotid artery, the cervical sympathetic chain, and also other cranial nerves in the skull base, and other important organs in the vicinity, like uh, uh, superior constrictor, pterygoids, and so on. So this is a very, very important area. There is a bit of confusion in the literature uh, between the radiotherapy and oncology literature and the surgical literature because in surgery, um, in the Robbins level, the retropharyngeal lymph nodes do not come in that classification at all. And actually, we very rarely operate in this area in the context of surgical oncology. In uh, the radiotherapy, the prevertebral lymph nodes are classified as level seven. Uh, with 7-2A uh, being the um, uh, retropharyngeal and 7-B being the retrostyloid. Whilst in the surgical literature, level 7 is a completely different anatomical compartment. It relates to the superior mediastinal lymph nodes and the inferior extension of the pretracheal lymph nodes, which are relevant in thyroid cancer. So to avoid any confusion, I'm not going to use any level uh, terminology, but uh, name them anatomically. So what constitutes pathological retropharyngeal lymph nodes? There's a variety of criteria, but the four strongest predictors for malignancy there are diameter. So if the short axis exceeds five millimeters, this lymph node should be considered pathological until proven otherwise. And that's slightly different to other cervical lymph nodes where we talk about one centimeter cutoffs. The presence of necrosis, the presence of PET-CT avidity, and the anatomical composition, as I said earlier, it is the lateral retropharyngeal group that is relevant to the head and neck oncology. A bit of radiotherapy from a surgeon, uh, but just it's very important to appreciate that uh, my colleague um, and collaborator, Robin Presswich from Leeds, who's done a lot of work, he's a radiotherapist in retropharyngeal metastasis. Uh, there is a, a big study they've done where they had 40 patients with oropharyngeal cancer and, and retropharyngeal metastases, and you can see here actual quantification of what I was talking about. So the median short axis was nine millimeters, and you can see the range goes down to five millimeters, so that would be the threshold. Out of those 40 patients, the vast majority, 37, uh, were metabolically active on PET-CT. Having said that, three were not, and those three were picked up, again, based on size criteria for MRI. The median SUV max was around 6.8, and all 40 were located in the lateral group. Okay, so back to surgery. Transcervical retropharyngeal neck dissection. This operation is almost never done. Oops, uh, is almost never done. 
and there's a good reason for it. Um, it, uh, it has a prohibitive morbidity. Um, so those patients, you can do a beautiful operation, take the nodes out, but the next day, usually what happens is the patient can't swallow, keeps aspirating. You scope the patient, recurrent laryngeal nerves are working beautifully, you can't understand what's going on. And basically, there is an interruption of the pharyngeal plexus, which is very, very difficult to manage among many other morbidities. So for that reason, we never perform this as part of the standard neck dissection or even a radical neck dissection. Very, very rarely will we go there to, in the context of oncology. Commonly we go for other reasons, but not for oncological purposes. And this is the morbidity issue. So as surgery involves and the shifting pendulum I was talking about, robotic surgery comes into play. And um, as you, uh, we wrote in a paper a few years ago, this may have a role in this particular subject. So TORS, I'm not going to go into details, we've already had discussions, but it gives you a lot of advantages. It gives you advantages with regards to the ergonomics, visualization, you've got a 3D visualization because you've got a dual chamber endoscope and mag magnification that can go up to 12 times up. And also you can have curved scopes so you can work around angles that you cannot do with the laser or the monopolar. So there's a lot of advantages there and seven degrees of freedom. So I don't want to go into much detail about uh, TORS itself, but basically uh, all those advantages uh, make it a potential tool for de-escalating treatment for retropharyngeal metastases. And if you look at the prognosis of retropharyngeal lymph nodes, the consensus in the literature is that they're associated with an adverse prognosis. And this applies both to head and neck SEC and differentiated thyroid cancer. Having said that, uh, we don't understand that very well. And the reason is what I told you. Because of the high morbidity, we rarely take any histology from there. So actually most of our decision making is based on radiological suspicion as opposed to histopathological confirmation of whether or not there's cancer there, which is really important. And clinically, this can also be occult because you can't really palpate this region or see it unless it's massive. So uh, this is something to bear in mind. Because TORS could have an advantage there, it could give you the histopathology as well that in most times you're not going to get. But why do we need the escalation? So at the moment, because of the reasons I've discussed, the gold standard and the standard practice is radiotherapy, which can be unilateral or bilateral, for, which is a different story. Radiotherapy works oncologically, undoubtedly so, but it is associated with high morbidity as well in this area. You know, the cranial nerves are there, the carotids are there, there's a lot of important structures. Also, at the same time, just like the previous lecture was talking about, we are facing an increasingly younger population. So all those HPV-related or pharyngeal cancers are increasingly younger. Their patients are likely to live longer and are of working age with young families. So these patients are very, at very high risk of having swallowing issues, if not in the short term, in the long term, because they're going to live longer to experience all the side effects, let alone radiation-induced sarcomas in the future, accelerated atherosclerosis, and increased risk of stroke, and the list goes on. And the same applies to thyroid cancer. Again, we see it increasingly in younger women. We've written a chapter recently on the quality of life of both for thyroid cancer and head and neck cancer in this context, and the quality of life basically is very suboptimal with radiotherapy as well. Not as a general statement, but overall, when we talk about this particular region of the head and neck. So I've already mentioned some of the reasons, the younger patient demographics, the long-term effects of radiotherapy, but also, of course, as I said in the very start, the morbidity of open approaches. So an open neck dissection in the pharyngeal space has an even higher morbidity, and that's why we don't practice it. And also, finally, the importance of personalized care. Not every patient is the same, not every cancer is the same, and so on. So what we thought and we worked on in a UK-US collaborative between the biggest centers in the UK and Europe and also colleagues from the US, uh, from Stanford and the University of Texas, we basically did this collaborative to uh, understand whether TORS could actually help us in understanding whether it may or if any have a role in the management of retropharyngeal metastasis in order to try to de-escalate treatment, especially for those younger patients and 
obviously I don't have time to go through the whole literature right now, so I'm going to give you some summative results. But basically there are three clinical scenarios where TORS may actually have a role in managing this very difficult and challenging scenario. The first one, which is relatively uncommon, is when you've got an early stage oropharyngeal cancer with a node negative neck, as in lateral neck, and uh, er but a retropharyngeal node that is lighting up or is suspicious morphologically on e uh, CT or MRI. In this context, uh, the more be uh, the, what the evidence uh, has shown, which is not very high to be honest, is 3B and the controls are suboptimal. But essentially the morbidity is undoubtedly higher if you add torse retropharyngeal dissection in addition to torse oropharyngectomy, especially when it comes to swallowing outcomes and to aspiration. Having said that, uh, the, there's a pickup rate of about 56% of occult metastatic disease, i.e. lymph nodes, just like those three I told you in the series before, where the patient has a cancer but it is not lighting up on PET and is not clinically manifesting itself. More importantly, out of the 30 patients, 11 of them were managed with single modality, i.e. they didn't need any adjuvant radiotherapy nine of which are, were N0. So what I'm trying to say here, obviously the numbers are very small and more research is needed, but this small uh, cohort of patients where you've got early disease, no neck nodes, and a suspicious retropharyngeal node, you should consider you know, this option because you, uh, you give the option to the patient of not having radiotherapy, which you can reserve in the future should you need it and prevent all those swallowing issues to an extent. Scenario two re -radiation. So, uh, Professor Argiris and Dr. Moraitis spoke about uh, this earlier in their presentation. This is a very, very difficult situation when you're in. When you've got a patient that's got a recurrence and you've already given radiotherapy, usually it's going to be an esophyringeal carcinoma, a bit like just like the scenario you gave earlier, uh, and the patient pops up a uh, suspicious retropharyngeal lymph node. As you very well know, re -radiation, has catastrophic morbidity. It's a big word to say, but uh, you know, skull-based osteom osteomyelitis is a very difficult uh, issue to deal with. Uh, it's not uncommon to get cranial palsy, swallowing issues, carotid blowouts from pseudoaneurysms, and so on. So re-radiation is is really something you 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 want to avoid if you can. So in that setting, uh, again, not high-level evidence. But uh, the majority, you can see here, there's only 20 cases internationally on this, 11 of whom are recurrent esopharyngeal cancer and six uh, recurrent oropharyngeal cancer. And the morbidity of those patients of performing TORS retropharyngeal neck dissection is significantly lower than their open counterpart or even their minimal invasive counterparts like maxillary swing or endoscopic assisted approaches. The highest morbidity, unsurprisingly, is in those patients that had an open conversion, but that may likely be a reflection of a robotic learning curve and patient selection rather than the technique itself. Of those patients, uh, 21 lymph nodes were resected. In one patient, there were two retropharyngeal nodes, and uh, all of them confirmed the, uh, the presence of metastatic disease, 18 of which uh, they were with clear margins. So in other words, those patients were spared from the need for re-radiation. Last uh, possible scenario relates to thyroid cancer, different disease entity. However, in thyroid cancer, we do every now and then see those patients that pop up a few years down the line uh, with the retropharyngeal lymph node that's lighting up on the iodine scan. And this is a very difficult, again, situation to deal with because what do you do? And the treat, you, know, you could argue for a watchful waiting approach, for radioiodine, for systemic therapy with TKIs, with surgery. If you do surgery, how do you do it? And for that reason, the controls in the literature are very, very actually substandard because they're massively heterogeneous. Nevertheless, there's th 13 cases done in this particular setting. And uh, the morbidity, at least in terms of the cranial nerve deficits against the other treatments, is lower. Of course, TORS is not an option for everyone the, for many reasons. But the biggest barrier, practical barrier I'm talking about, is access. So we've published this many years ago, but basically, as we were saying earlier with Dr. Moraitis, if you can't get the access, that's it, you know, you can't do the operation, you should consider an alternative. Uh, so in summary, there is a need for de-escalation in this 
group of patients with retropharyngeal metastases, whether they're from SCC of the head and neck or cervical esophagus or thyroid. And there are three scenarios where uh, there is a potential role. To summarize, uh, this is a very difficult uh, setting. Uh, this is something that should only be practiced in very high volume centers by MDTs, very experienced surgeons in the context of trials. But it is something that we should definitely consider for the future. And obviously we need more research. I've got some papers there for you. This is the original paper. And then this is more of a pictorial summary of the other paper and uh, a historical narrative of how the management of retropharyngeal metastasis used to be, is now, and where are we heading to with all this technology. Many thanks.